Hey everybody, and welcome to the fourth video in our Flutter and Focus series on asynchronous coding in Dart. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to use Dart's async and await keywords to simplify your code. A lot of languages have async and await in their syntax, and the first time I saw them, I remember being weirded out. I knew you tagged a function as async, the return type changed, and somewhere in the middle there was a break where it would wait, but at the time it just seemed magical and weird. Uh, I have some good news for you all watching this, though. If you've seen the first few videos in this series, you already know the things you need to fully understand async and await. And that's because at the end of the day, they're really just an alternate syntax for using futures and streams that can help you write cleaner, more readable code. Let's start with a simple example. Say I have a class that represents some process data. I can, I can give it a string and it'll do some business logic that I need done. I also have a method that'll load an ID value from disk and another that'll fetch some network data that I can use with my class. Network and file IO are asynchronous operations, so they return futures. I'd like to write a single method that will put these pieces together. First, it should load an ID from disk, then use that ID to make a network call, then make a processed data object with the result. With Dart's futures API, I can use then to chain callbacks together so that the completed value of the first future becomes the parameter for the next callback, and so on. This technique was covered earlier in the series, and it works great. The code isn't as readable as it would be if this were all synchronous, though. If it weren't for the futures, that code could be written like this, right? Make some calls in order, no big whoop. Well, the big deal about async and await is that you can have code that looks like this and uses futures. First, add the async keyword just before the opening brace. This is just a way of telling Dart, hey, I plan to use the await keyword in here. Speaking of which, next up is placing the await keyword in front of each future the function needs to wait for. It can't call fetch network data without the ID from load from disk, so there needs to be an await there and it can't create a process data object without the data from the network, so there needs to be an await there. The last change is to make the return type a future. That might look weird at first, because the return statement on this function just uses a regular process data object. But before create data here completes, it has to wait on two futures. That means it's going to start executing, then stop and wait for a disk event, then keep going, then stop and wait for a network event, and only after that can it provide a value. So when create data starts running and hits that first await, right then it returns a future to the calling function. It says, hey, looks like I'm going to have to wait on some stuff. Here's this empty box. You hold on to that, and when I'm done waiting for this disk in the network, I'll call the return statement and put some data in there for you. Go put it in a future builder or something. And that's how this works. Before moving on, Let's take a quick look back at the event loop and how it works with both versions of the code you just saw. We started with this one, which uses the Futures API. And one of the nice things about the Futures API is that you can easily see how the code is broken down for the events involved. First, the function starts running and calls into load from disk. Then it waits. It waits for some data from the disk to arrive at the event loop. That completes the future returned by load from disk. So the callback from the first then statement is invoked, and a network request goes out. Then, create data waits again. It waits for some network data to arrive at the event loop. That completes the future returned by fetch network data, so the second callback is invoked, some process data is created, and now the future that was returned by this create data is completed with that value. Now, let's do the same thing again using the async await version of the code. Spoiler alert. It's the exact same process. Before, we could use the calls to then to imagine how the code is broken down event by event. Here, you can do the same thing by breaking the code after each await expression. So we get this nice line by line progression. Let's run it. Create data starts executing and hits that first await. At that point, it returns its own future to the calling function and invokes load from disk. Then, just like before, it waits for that file I.O. event from the disk. That completes the future returned by load from disk, 
which means create data is done awaiting on it and can go on to the rest of the code. Next, it calls fetch network data and waits again. Eventually, the network data arrives at the event loop. That completes the future returned by fetch network data. And so create data is free to move on again. It creates and returns an instance of process data, which completes the future that create data gave to its caller way back at the beginning. As you can see, in both cases, the same event loop controls the action and the same futures are involved. The only real change is that with async await, the function is smaller and looks more like synchronous code. Hopefully at this point, some of you are thinking, hey, I watched a couple of the other videos in this series and you said futures could complete either with data or an error. What's up with async await and errors? The answer is that async and await also help make your error handling look more like what it would be with synchronous code. If we go back to that first example based on the futures API, error handling code might look like this. It uses catch error to test and respond to errors, and when complete, to execute a callback at the very end, whether there's an error or not. With async and await, on the other hand, rather than using additional callbacks, you can use try catch. Inside a function tagged with the async keyword, try catch blocks will handle asynchronous errors the same way they handle synchronous ones in normal functions. You can use the on and catch keywords to trap specific types of exceptions and finally, we'll execute its code block at the end, as you would expect. OK, there's one last thing to cover, and that's how to use a wait with a for loop to process data from a stream. This is a much less common use case for the await keyword, but it is something you can do. Say I have a function that can take in a list of numbers and add them all up. That's pretty straightforward, right? I can just use a for loop to iterate over the values. What if I wanted this function to take a stream of numbers instead? add them up asynchronously as they arrive, and then, when the stream was finished, return that sum. Just like with futures, async await helps me make that happen without changing the basic structure of the code. First, I tag the function as async. Then I change the return type to a future. And then I add the await keyword in front of four, and I'm done. Just like with futures, the await keyword is separating my function into the parts that execute before and after waiting on events. First, it starts executing and gets all the way to that await. Then it returns its future to the calling function and waits for a piece of data to arrive. When it does, the loop executes once to process that piece of data and then stops and waits for the next one. Maybe the app runs off and does some other things, garbage collects, whatever. Eventually, though, another piece of data arrives, and the loop goes around again. This keeps happening until the stream is finished and closes. When that happens, the function exits the loop and executes its return statement. That completes the future that getTotal here gave to its caller way back at the beginning. One important thing to keep in mind when using await for is that you should only use it with streams you know are going to complete. If you try to use this with a stream of clicks coming from an HTML button, for example, that stream lasts as long as the button's around, which means your loop could just keep right on waiting. All right, that's all we have for this video, but there's one more left in the series, and we'll be talking about generator functions. These are functions that can return multiple values over time, creating a stream of data on the fly. So be on the lookout for that, and head to dart.dev and flutter.dev for more info on Dart and Flutter. Hey, if you enjoyed that video, try these others. Or subscribe to the Flutter channel. It's Google's new portable UI toolkit. There's a button around here somewhere. <laughs>